All right, good evening. We're back again. So glad that you have plugged in to worship with us. Thank you for being here. Let's worship the Lord together.
once again, thank you so very much for just taking time out of your busy schedule and plugging in with us uh, for this evening's service. I really appreciate it. It means the world to us, so thank you. Um, we, are, we are coming to the end of our study uh, through the book of Hebrews. We are in Hebrews chapter 13. Again, if you have your Bible, we'd love for you to have that open in front of you. There's something powerful about just holding the Word of God in your hands. And so if you have that, go ahead and open the book of Hebrews. We're in the last chapter, chapter 13. And really, the author just begins these closing remarks. What we see in chapter 13 is we see the general guidelines for Christian living. Hebrews is a, uh, theologically, as you have seen, it can be a deep book. It talks about the, the high priest of the Lord Jesus Christ. It talks about how Jesus is greater than the angels. It talks about all these different elements. But now as he's getting ready to close down the book, he wants to make sure that he closes on a practical note. Listen, theology must influence the way that we live. It's not enough just to have a lot of knowledge. It's not enough to, to have a lot of Bible stories in our heart or a lot of workbooks that we have filled out or a lot of sermons that we have listened to. All of these things, all of these different uh, studies, the, the theology that we have, it must result in a change in the way that we live. I believe that one of the greatest problems in Christianity today is that what we do is we take our life and we divide it into these two compartments. And on the one side, we have our secular life. And on the other side, we have our spiritual life. And we can come into church on Sunday and we can look spiritual like everybody else. And there's no problems in my life. I have no problems in my family. My faith is strong and I've got this smile on and uh, everything is looking good. The family's wearing their best clothes. The kids don't have a hair out of place. Everybody's on their best behavior. And we can come in with the spiritual side and we can be so phony and so fake. But then we go out into the world and we're something entirely different. And so we have these, these two spheres in our life, the life of the spirit and the life of the street. But biblically, those two are meant to be integrated. Real world faith is often replaced with this shallow substitute, a spiritual looking religion that is irrelevant to the everyday life. And folks, that is a, a tragedy. It is a tragedy because it is through the, the daily practices of life that the gospel is spread. It is through individuals who are managing their finances in a godly way that God is glorified. It, it's through a, a husband and wife who are going out on a date after 15, 20 years of marriage and they're still in love with one another, that, that's what points to the glory of God. It's a, it's a mama who's wiping off the dirty face of her child. It, it, it's, it's a love relationship to where somebody is just known for their love. They love people well. It, it's by the, the way that we serve one another that the world looks in and they say, that is different. You see, that happens when we let the, the Word of God, we let our theology come in and begin to transform our daily living. The world sees past our hypocrisy. The Lord sees past our religious words and they're wanting to know what are you going to do in your life because you know Christ. Religious activity is not what's going to change the world around us. The world is going to be changed when we begin to live out our faith. And so with that in mind, the author of Hebrews is wrapping up his writing and he says, now go out and live like this in your life. If you want to make a difference in the world around you, these are some ways that you can do it. So look, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to read a little bit, but we're not going to discuss all of this tonight. He says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who were mistreated, since you are also in the body. 
Verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I love it because it's so practical. Did you catch it? He says, love one another. Show hospitality to strangers. He said, be content in what you have. He said, honor your marriage. God is always with us. So in these practical elements of life, we're going to shine brightly for the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first point, main thing we're looking at tonight is simply this attitude of loving fellow Christians. Loving fellow Christians. I heard about a man and one day he was with his friend and they were out on the golf course and they were playing a little golf and the guys were getting into the game and, and man was up and he was about to make his chip shot. And as he prepared to, to hit the ball, he looked up and he saw a long funeral procession driving down the road. And so he stopped, he took his hat off, and he just kneels down and he gets on his knee, he bows his head, and he's in this moment of uh, just solitude. And his friend saw this and he said, wow, man, that's the most thoughtful and touching thing I have ever seen in all of my life. Uh, I think that's great of you to stop your golf game for this funeral procession. What a, what a glorious way to show respect and honor. And the man got up and he said, well, I think that's the least I could do because we were married for 35 years and I figured I at least owed her that much. Sometimes that's what we want to do with God. We want to just give God a nod with our life, a nod as we continue on with business as usual. But you'll see in verse one, he says, let brotherly love continue. This word brotherly, it is the Greek word Philadelphia. It is a very important virtue in the New Testament. In the first century, the word brother was meant primarily for those in the same family. You have a brother, you have a sister. We, we understand that. In its general sense, when you go back to the Old Testament, it began, began to talk about those who were at least in the same race. The Jewish people might call other Jewish people my brother. But when Jesus comes in the New Testament, the word begins to take this dynamic change and the word begins to refer to those who are in the family of God. So brothers are no longer those who are blood brothers. We're not talking about the same race or the same people, but we're talking about those who are brothers because they are in the family of God. You see, John 1.12, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Here's a principle we need to understand. Because we have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are family. We are family if we have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open your Bible, flip through, begin to read, and you will see over and over and over again, it talks about the family of God. And so the point he's making is we are brothers, we are family, and so we had better begin to love one another and treat each other as family. You know what's interesting about family? With family, you do not always agree. Right? I, I've got family and, and sometimes we disagree, sometimes we, we bicker, but there's this love that holds us together in a way that nothing can separate us. And that's what it ought to be like in the kingdom of God, that as Christians we are united in love and it changes everything about us. When you look through the book of Hebrews, you're going to find this terminology, the word brothers, he's going to use it 11 times. Because all through the book, he's trying to remind his readers, you are family. You have been united in this, this great way through Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember what the greatest commandment is? Matthew chapter uh, 22, uh, a man comes up and says, Lord, what is, what is the greatest commandment, right? Pretty much that's what he says. He, he's trying to, to trap the Lord and uh, Jesus responds. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. For this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, all the other laws hang on them. And so he's saying, here's the first two, love God and love others. We love the Lord with all that we have. And then in response to that, we are people of love with those around us. Many in this culture, they have been rejected by their family. Their parents have disowned them. They may have lost their spouse. Their children may want nothing to do with them. And so their earthly family has vanished. It has disappeared. But they are shown now to be coming in to this new family that is the family of God. Do you know what John 13 says? It says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you go to church every Sunday. That's not what it says. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you give lots of money. That's not what he says. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is the way that we show that we belong to Christ. It's interesting because this love is different than the worldly love. Biblical love is not based upon our personal likes or our personal dislikes. Biblical love transcends what we like and what we don't like. It transcends our personal preferences. And what's beautiful is when we have a church family which is full of people who are very different, full of people who have very little in common, full of people who normally would not associate together, but because of the love of Jesus Christ, they come together in love week after week and they genuinely care for each other. Romans 12, 10, write this down, circle it. It's a great scripture. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. And then it says this, outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another and then make it a contest. Try to outdo folks in the way that you honor them and the way that you show them love. Can you imagine if in your marriage you did that? If in your marriage you had this competition every day when you wake up and you just looked over at your, your wife and you said, I'm going to love you better than you love me today. And you went throughout the day and you just try to do those little thoughtful things to show how much you love your spouse. And you do that with your children. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love my kids so good today. I am going to do this all day long. You go to work and you see your coworkers. I'm going to outdo my coworkers in love. And your entire attitude was an attitude that was built around loving others. 1 John 3, 17. He says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You see, he's saying love, but love equals action. Love always equals action. When you see a, a brother or a sister in need and you really love them, how can you not help? Uh, I'm amazed by just the sovereignty of God. This week I was, I was sitting down, I was working on this sermon. And I'm typing away, you know, and I'm going through these scriptures and I'm looking at different verses containing love and my phone rings. And so I, I answer the phone and this, this, this lady's on the other end of the phone and uh, she's a member of our church. And she says, hey, Brother Case, I've got a, a little something I'd like to do and want to run it by you. And I said, OK. And she said, well, there's a there's a family in our church and I think they could use a little bit of help. And so we would like to go and buy them just a basket full of groceries. And uh, we'd like to give that to them, but we don't want them to know it came from us. And so can we bring that to the church and could you guys maybe deliver that to them? We want to be a blessing, but we don't want them to think, you know, we're, we're trying to just uh, push things on them. And so could we do that? That's love. That is this biblical family of God love. You see someone hurting and you want to come and help them. That's, that's awesome. And then a couple of days later, I'm sitting and I'm, I'm working on something. My phone rings again. Uh, and, and there's a, a man on the other side and says, hey, can you meet me down in the office? And I said, well, sure. He said, well, we just, you know, we've been blessed so much and we've got a little extra money and we want to just leave it for a family that's in need. 
And so I go down and there's a stack of hundred dollar bills that this other family left and they say, hey, just use this for somebody who is hurting. It's things like that that just shows the power of the family of God, the power of love to where I am not so selfish that I have to hold on to everything, but I'm going to look for an opportunity to help someone else. When's the last time you love somebody in this way? You love, and, and he's talking about brothers in Christ. He's talking about the family of God. When's the last time that you really showed your love for somebody in the family of God? You say, well, how do I do that? Listen, it's not all about money. It, it could be that you, you see a prayer request come through the email and, and you, you take a minute and you, you pray for the individual in their struggles. And then you give them a phone call and you say, hey, I just want you to know that I, I love you and I'm praying for you. If there's anything I can do for you, please just let me know. Do you know what a difference that would make? To have that sort of compassion to where when somebody's hurting, you hurt with them. It could be a beautiful thing. Or maybe somebody is going through a tough time and so one afternoon you go and you just mow their grass for them. You just mow their grass. Something easy, maybe it takes you a couple hours, but in that couple of hours, you're gonna make such a difference in their life because you're putting action to your love. Maybe it's delivering groceries. Maybe it's, it's cooking a meal. We've got cooking teams who are meeting Tuesdays and Thursdays here at the church. And we need different teams to come up and be a part of that. What a way to show love, to come up for two, three hours and cook a meal for those who are in need in our community. Or, or deliver a meal. We need teams to go out and to make deliveries. And so say, like, I can do that. I can take an hour on a Tuesday lunchtime and I can go and deliver these baskets of food. Maybe it's sending somebody a text or an email and just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. There are so many ways that we can show love to others, but the principle is, as the family of God, we are to show love by our actions. Because I believe that what folks are longing for is they're longing for genuine love. Do you know that people are hurting? We know that, people are hurting right now. I, I was listening to a podcast and it was talking about these uh, telemarketers. You know, we get those phone calls and uh, your, your uh, auto warranty is about to expire. We want to sell you. So there's, there's these telemarketers. And what usually happens is the telemarketers make a phone call and folks hang up on them. And so that is what they're accustomed to. But ever since this pandemic has struck, everything's changed. Now the telemarketers are saying when they call someone, they cannot get out the phone with them. Folks are longing for, for community. They're longing for just interaction with another individual that the folks on the other end of the line, they are sharing their problems and their concerns and their difficulties. And so it's almost like these telemarketers are turning into counselors as they're making these cold calls. It, it just shows the way that the heart is longing for community. It shouldn't be the telemarketers that have that responsibility. It is us who are the church. We've got the hope. We've got the good news. We've We've got the answer and the solution and so we're to go out in the world and to make a difference first John 4 7 and 8 says beloved let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God anyone who does not love does not know God because why because God is love you know a lot of folks they have birthmarks on their bodies or they have a, a mole or some kind of distinctive mark and that's one of the ways you can uh, you know see somebody and know who they are they have this distinction about them as Christians our distinctive mark is love the way that people are going to see us and know that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus is because we are people of love Francis Schaeffer the great apologist, he said this, he said, love is the final apologetic. It is the defense for which there is no defense. You wanna win somebody to Christ, the best way to win them is by genuine love. Now, now let's go the opposite direction for just a moment. The worst thing that we can do in the family of God, the most destructive thing that we can do in the family of God, is to exchange love for one another with gossip and with slander 
and with words that, that cut us down. And instead of building each other up, we begin to tear each other down. And I want to tell you the enemy is looking for ways to bring disunity in the church and chop it down at the base. Churches are not destroyed from the outside in. Churches are destroyed from the inside out. Somebody amen on that. You've seen that happen before. You have seen where churches are destroyed and it is when somebody comes inside the church and they begin to cause disunity and they begin to run their mouth and they begin to send messages and they begin to do things that do not bring honor and glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and they begin to gather their troops and then there is this disunity within the kingdom of God and that is not right and it should not be tolerated inside the body of Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians, it says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. When you open your mouth, ask the question, is this building someone up? Is this building up the church or is this tearing down the church? It's 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, So put away all malice. Listen, you, you got some, some ill wishes in your heart. Put it away. Put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy, all envy and all slander. There's no place for this inside the church, inside the family of God. Learn to give grace to folks. There, there are going to be times that you get your feelings hurt. That's just life. You ever had your feelings hurt in your family? All of us have. People, we say things, sometimes we shouldn't, things happen, but let's be a people of grace. You're going to find what you're looking for in life. And if you're always looking for a problem, you're always looking for a fault, you're going to find it. But we ought to be a people who in love, we're not looking for a fault, we're not looking for a problem, but we are looking for the best in people. All right, we've got to wrap up. I'm taking too much of your time. Let's just kind of wrap this up together, okay? What if I have a problem with a brother, okay? So you're sitting there and you say, well, you know what? I need to love my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I've got a problem. What am I going to do? The good news is the Bible lays that out for us. I love it. The Bible says this in Matthew 5. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So here's the picture. You're, you're finally able to come back to church. And you're, you're out and you're, you're singing and you're raising your hands and glory, glory, hallelujah. And all of a sudden you remember that you've got this problem with uh, somebody else. There, there's a break in the relationship. You know what the Bible says? Bible says in that moment you are to leave. Leave your, your sacrifice. Leave your offering. Just leave and go find reconciliation. That's how important it is. Did you know that I, I don't find another time in the Bible where we're told just to leave the worship gathering? Usually we're talking about come into worship and preachers. And I'm saying come worship with us. Be a part of this service. But I'm telling you if right now you've got a problem with a brother or a sister in Christ best thing for you to do would be to push the pause button and go get on the phone go get in the car go find a way to reconcile with your brother or sister that's what's going to bring honor and glory to the lord jesus christ right now go ahead are you thinking of somebody i give you permission turn this off and go bring about reconciliation that is the change that comes with being a child of god you say well case man that's going to be tough I've been holding on to this grudge for a long time. And I think I'm right in this situation. You know, sometimes being a Christian is not easy. Sometimes the standard that is placed upon us is pretty high. Sometimes we're gonna have to be the ones to swallow our pride. We're gonna have to be the ones to say, you know what, I'm sorry. You're waiting on somebody else to say it, don't wait on them, you go and say, I'm sorry. You know, we, we've had this miscommunication and uh, it bothers me and I want to be reconciled. So I am sorry. Would you please forgive me? I want to see a restoration of our relationship. That honors God, folks. That, that honors God in a big way. I've had to do that in my life. 
But there's been a, a time that there was a, a, a fella and we just, you know, some things happened and there was a, a, just some division in our relationship. And I had to go see him and call him to the side and just say, hey, I don't know exactly what's happened, but I want you to know that I'm sorry. I, I really am. I, I hate that there's division between us. I can feel it. It, it bothers me. I, I want to be reconciled. Would you please forgive me? And, and the man said, well, sure. And, and he apologized and, and we prayed together and everything is good. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. And that's how the family of God is to operate. You say, well, well how do I do this? Give me some more details. Let me give you one more set of scriptures or so. And we're going we're gonna to wrap up, I promise. Matthew 18, the Bible lays out the, the steps to reconcile. He says, if your brother has sinned against you, Okay, so you believe that your brother has done something wrong. He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay, so you go directly to that individual. You don't, you don't go all over uh, Facebook with it. You don't tell everybody. You don't begin to gossip. If somebody has offended you, you go to them directly. That's biblical. You cannot argue with that. You go directly with this person alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if there's no reconciliation with just the two of you, find, find a, a couple of other godly individuals and then you go with them and you, you try to bring reconciliation. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So here's what he says. First step is to go directly to the individual. And many times if we would do that, the problem would, would go away. Many times the, the arguments we have, they are based on false information. And so if we would just be mature and go to the individual, we're going to find out that, hey, it's not that big of a deal. But if you do that and it doesn't work, then find you a brother or sister in Christ and then go try to bring reconciliation. If that doesn't work, then come to some church leadership and, and let, let's begin to see if there can be a way that we begin to mend that together. The whole point is that we begin to restore relationships. I, I've got my two boys, Mason and Maddox. They're gonna be 10 uh, in less than a month. I, I can't believe it, it's crazy. But you know what I cannot stand? As a father, I cannot stand when they fight. It drives me up the wall. When I go home and I see them just being rude to each other and being hateful to each other, it makes my skin begin to crawl. And I'll have that talk. Boys, you are brothers. You must love each other. What are you talking about? You are blessed. And it just, I mean, it really, it, it aggravates me. You know what I love? I love it when I see my boys loving on each other. It, it is one of the greatest things for me. The other day, we were playing basketball, and Maddox fell off the concrete, and he kind of twisted his ankle. And he goes down, and we all go rush on him um, and, and pick him up, and we carry him in the house. And I set him on the chair, and I'm, I'm kind of getting him all set up, propped up. And here comes Mason. I say, Mason, what are you doing, baby? He said, well, Daddy, I, I, got, a, I got a bag of ice so I can put it on, on Bubba's ankle. And so he comes over and he, he gets a pillow and he puts uh, Max's leg up and he sets this ice on it. And he said, Maddox, I'm going to be right over here on the couch. If you need anything, just tell me. Max, you want a drink? You want a snack? Max, you tell me if you need anything. And he was just, he was taking care of his brother. Y'all, it blessed my heart so much to see my kids loving each other. And you know what I think God wants? I think he wants the same thing. I really think that there is so much displeasure from the Lord when his own children cannot get along. It's a sad, sad reality. But there is so much pleasure when the church loves each other in action to outdo one another in love. And so, you know, we're going to stop right there. We covered about three words. We covered let brotherly love continue. And so we didn't get very far, but there, there's a lot to swallow in this. So I want you to think about it. Just where you are right now. I want, I want you to really think about this. I believe God's speaking. 
Are there any relationships in your life that need reconciliation? Are there any relationships that when you think of someone, maybe your heart begins to beat fast just because you know there's a problem in that relationship? You see, you've got, you've got two choices. You can continue as normal, hold on to that resentment, or you can be biblical and you can seek reconciliation. Both passages we looked at, what's the first step? You go to that individual directly and you try to bring restoration. Maybe that means that tonight you need to make a phone call. Maybe you need to hop in the car and you need to make a, a visit. Maybe you need to, to apologize even though you feel like you're the one in the right. That's okay. But I wonder, is there a relationship in your life that needs reconciliation? And the next thing, we've got to, we've got to love each other. What are you doing to love your brothers and sisters? Who do you know that's hurting that you can help this week? What can you do to show your love, to have action with your love? The churches, they're destroyed from the inside out. When we hear gossip and we hear slander and we see somebody that is that's being used to bring destruction to our family of believers, we must shut that down. That's not a way we can, we can play with it or carry on with it because the kingdom of God is worth more. And so let us be a people of love. Thank you again so much for being with us this evening. So glad that you, you've been here. Like I say every week, if you need anything, just get in contact with us. My email address, case at whbchurch.com. Give us a call here at the church. We'd love to help you in any way that we possibly can. Listen, I, I know this message is kind of tough, kind of hits home with a lot of us, but we will glorify God so greatly in our obedience. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again uh, for tonight. Thank you for the blessings of your word. Lord, I pray that we will be a people of love, a people of love with action because God, we know that you are love. And so Lord, I pray that we will, we will not be a people of gossip or slander or malice in our hearts. But God, if there's any, any break in a relationship with someone else, God, I pray that we will seek reconciliation and God, that you will provide restoration. Lord, that we will be unified as the family of God. And we'll be able to continue serving you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for all your blessings. We love you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray and we ask these things. Amen. Have a great week and we will see you soon.